A tēnā rā koutou katoa, a nei te taku mihi a kia koutou, a, a, mō a tēnei hui, a e nā rangatira, a tēnā koutou e hoa mā. A, ko waiau, a ko Jay Ruka a tōku uno, a he uru, a, he uru nō a Taranaki Maunga, a, nō reira a Tia Te Aua a tōku iwi, engāri e noho ana au e nai nei a, kei a whaenga roa. Uh, my name is Jay. Uh, I whaka papa to Taranaki Maunga, uh, part of the Te Atiawa Iwi, uh, but I now uh, reside uh, here in Whaingaroa, Raglan, where I'm coming to you from my little cubbyhole, uh, my converted shed, my office, uh, which has got a bunch of my toys in it that I play music with, etc, uh, etc, et and do my mahi from. So uh, for you guys who are watching this video and are gathering for your hui, uh, it is jolly good to be with you here today. Uh, it is my privilege to come and share with you some thoughts, some kōrero uh, that Anne and I have met with and has, she has really given me an, a, a, a bit of an open platform. So I want to approach uh, our talk about the inter, interrelation between Christianity and our faith and the gospel and te ao Māori. And uh, when she said to me about uh, approaching this hui, um, really one of the key things that came to my mind is a little kōrero about Te Tiriti o Waitangi, about the treaty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen in a moment, and I, I, I want to rush through a story of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Now, when the story of the treaty has been spoken, uh, if you, if you look at most history books, the, the missionaries and the early church in New Zealand uh, rarely get a mention as far as the intricacies of their involvement with the Treaty of Wating. But an honest reflection and an honest presentation of the story of the treaty cannot bypass the story of the gospel, the missionaries, and early Christianity. And within that framework, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all of the narrative. But what secular historians have liked to focus on when it comes to uh, Christianity's involvement is the ugly part, of it, which to a degree, you know, fair enough. If it, if it, if it didn't have, you know, some, some, some good stuff to it, then, then, then why bother to tell the story? And that, unfortunately, for the last 45 years in particular, has been the narrative that has been taught. If Christianity or the missionaries have been mentioned, it's, it's only by way of negativity. So uh, as I said before, I'm going to tell you a story, but the story that I'm going to tell is essentially comes from a pro-missionary perspective. In other words, looking at some of the positive elements as to why our missionary forebears wanted, uh, that thought the treaty was a good idea. Um, my, my my reasoning on telling this story is so that we can bring it into the present and go, hey, how are we doing right now in being as uh, followers of Ihu Karaiti? I, I, I realize maybe not everyone in my audience today is, but for most who are, for those of us who are followers of the way of Jesus, uh, how are we doing today in telling that part of the story in regards to Te Tiriti or Waitangi? So uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, I've never done this before, so I hope it all comes across. And uh, you will just luckily be able to see a little portion of me and see this slide. So once upon a time, Anne uh, here a paki waitara here a kōrero mo te tiriti o Waitangi. Here is a little story about the treaty. So um, uh, once upon a time, there was... Uh, the treaty. Uh, we all know the story in uh, February, February 1840, where Hobson uh, and uh, missionaries and those uh, who resided in Aotearoa gathered for the signing of the treaty. The day the treaty was signed, there's an estimation of between 2,000 and 2,500 
uh, non Maori, so Europe, mainly Europeans, few Americans, few from around the around the place who had gathered at that, uh, who were li actually living in the country. Out of an estimate, and there was an estimated population of two hundred thousand Maori at that time. So, uh, just to put it in perspective, if there was an understanding that this was some sort of colonial takeover of a country, then just based on population size, that wasn't going to happen <laughs> because the uh, the amount of uh, the population of Māori at the time far superseded uh, that which of who was from Europe at that time. So um, let's. What I want to do today is just share some really quickly some of the uh, brief key points that um, brought the treaty into being. What was the context of the story of the treaty? Uh, hands up if you've been to Kororareka. Uh, Kororareka is now known as Russell, and this is an image in the early 1830s of, uh, of, of Russell and of Kororareka. Now, um, I don't know if you know this, but in the late 1830s, a fellow by the name of um, uh, Charles Darwin uh, came to Kororareka. And he coined this phrase, he called Kororareka the hellhole of the South Pacific. In the 1830s, you had an average of about a thousand sailing vessels coming to Kororareka every year. You had ships from, obviously from England, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, from Scandinavia. You had ships even coming from China. Uh, ships from Samoa, uh, Portugal, um, Holland. Uh, all um, visitors, adventurers, sailors, uh, whalers, sealers coming from around the globe to visit the South Seas. And when they came down to the South Seas, uh, it had garnered this reputation of, hey, if you want to have a good time, get down to Kororareka, where you can uh, get off your ship and experience some of the South Pacific Polynesian exotic wahine. So if you could imagine a thousand sailing ships coming here every year, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 sailors, so anywhere from 20 to 30,000 men coming um, to the Bay of Islands every year, you're going to have, uh, uh, you're going to have mayhem happening. Um, Kororareka became uh, known as the hellhole of the South Pacific due to drunkenness, due to prostitution, uh, uh, due to all of the hanky-panky that sea-legged sailors that had been sea for months wanted to get up to. So one of uh, the, the, the first point uh, uh, that I want to share about one of the contexts that brought about the treaty was the fact that uh, globalization was well and truly hitting the South Pacific in the 1830s. The nations were coming here, and what's more, the nations were out of control. There was a lot of uh, drunkenness and debauchery that were happening across uh, across the other side, uh, uh, from Paihia and Waitangi over to Kororareka. Um, there was a lot of um, problems going on there that was out of control. So that's the first reason. Uh, second reason I want to share is about this fella, Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Now, uh, before I go any further, my apologies to anyone who is part of the Wakefield whanau. Um, uh, which, uh, if you are in the audience today, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about how I'm going to talk about your tupuna. But uh, the cool thing is, is right now, having passed into uh, Te Pō, uh, having passed uh, through this life into the next, he is now enlightened <laughs> and knows better. But uh, let me tell you a bit about this guy. Uh, Edward Gibbon Wakefield, uh, in his early 20s, ran away with a, an Englishman's poli uh, a, a Polish politician's daughter, uh, he, uh, who was uh, 16 years old. He got into a whole bunch of mischief, uh, and uh, him, and, he, and, and he was actually thrown into prison for getting up to some mischief. When he was in prison, he studied economics for three years. And when he, uh, and when he was re released, and after his study of economics, he asked the question, man, how can... Uh, we make, uh, how, how can I make a whole lot of money? Now, this guy also had, was a part of a, um, he was actually a part of an incredible Christian family, actually. Um, so he had, 
a philanthropic bent to him due to mainly due to his grandmother who was an amazing woman um but however he was the black sheep of the family and sort of didn't follow a a christian tradition if that makes sense so he while he was part of his sort of cultural christian heritage uh, he was the black sheep of the family and was very much interested in making money uh, and so his economic theory was is that the people of England, particularly in the cities of London, of Bristol, of Manchester, of York, of Newcastle, were uh, in, 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 the, in the early 1800s were just flop, uh, swamped with poverty. You had people living in the slums of England and at the same time were part of the British Empire, who were the largest empire of the globe, and we had all of these colonies around the world. And so he proposed this economic theory of, well, what if we flushed out the slums of England uh, and uh, sent people uh, to live in the, these uh, colonial places we had around the world? So he started a company which uh, was called the New Zealand Company. And he came up with this idea that, uh, uh, that why don't we sell land to impoverished people in England? That way we can become, uh, that, that way they can become landowners uh, overseas and become, um, get on, I, I guess, get out of the slums and get onto the, the, the property ladder. So the Wakefield, uh, the Wakefield brothers and the New Zealand company uh, uh, Edward sent, uh, sent over his brother William, and in 1839, uh, they advertised for the sale of land in New Zealand before they even owned land in New Zealand. And as Edward Brothers set off sale, he went, came over to New, New Zealand in 1839 uh, to purchase, to try and purchase land for the, these people over in England to, per, to, to buy land. Now, Edward had been lobbying the government since 1837, wanting to, 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 to put this proposal forward, but it didn't happen because of a, a, a thing that I'll send next. But the interesting thing is that um, because the government didn't agree to their plan, uh, the New Zealand company basically said, I'll st stuff you government, we're just going to go ahead and do it. So they set sail in 1839, or around about August, I think it was. Uh, and um, began to send people uh, over here uh, to become landowners in New Zealand. Um, so that's the second thing I want to talk about. First thing was Kororo Areka. The second context I want to talk about is the Wakefields and the New Zealand Company, that they began to try and colonise New Zealand before the British gov government even wanted to. So that's what was going on there. Now, the reason the government didn't, in England, didn't accept Wakefield's proposal was because of what the history books call the humanitarians. Uh, um, and that was the likes, in particularly, uh, a guy called Sir James Stephen, who was actually William Wilberforce's nephew. Now, Sir James Stephen and uh, the humanitarians were voices in the colonial office that was looking after the British colonies, uh, and these guys uh, in the eighteen in in the mid eighteen thirties, who stood up to the British government and said, "Hey guys, you know what we've done in our empire expanding? You know what we tried to do in Sierra Leone and in Ghana uh, when the trade slave uh, uh, when the trade slave came came down, and we tried to." establish our policies. You know what we've done in India? We've just gone in and railroaded the people. So around 1836, 1830, from 1836 in particular, there was a really strong conscience voice that was being um, risen within the British government, where uh, men and women were articulating that, hey, we haven't done well with the plight of indigenous peoples wherever the British Empire was gone. So when it came around the 1837, or particularly in 1839, when the question of the need to colonise New Zealand came up in the English 
Parliament. Sir James Stevens stood up within the Parliament and said, you know what, guys, if we're going to colonise New Zealand, then there's no way we're going to do it like what has been done in, in the past. Because the way that we've treated Indigenous people is absolutely appalling. So if we're going to enter in uh, to a colonisation process with, uh, with Māori down there in New Zealand, who of, of course the British government had known about for a very long time, then we're going to enter into, an, into a treaty partnership, into a treaty agreement with those people. We're not just going to come in and railroad it like we have done in the past. So in 1839, the voice of conscience for the first time arose uh, within uh, the British government's um, thinking, uh, which was really, really amazing. And uh, once again, that was the work of the gospel at play in people like Sir James Stephen rising up within the British Parliament. Now, a couple of things I want to share. So uh, I, I've, I've shared Kororo Arika, I've shared about New uh, New the New Zealand Company, and I've sh shared about the humanitarians within inside the British government. Now, what were, what were our chiefs thinking? What, what were our people thinking? Why did Te Ao Māori, or why did the uh, Rangatira, why did they want to enter into a treaty with the Crown? A couple of reasons here I'll share is, uh, I've already uh, shared about Kororareka and the hellhole of the South Pacific. Our chiefs knew that those people that were creating mayhem over in um, Kororareka, they, 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 they weren't our people, they were someone else's. So if uh, Kuwini uh, Wikitoria was uh, was willing and able to step in and create an, a, a governing structure that could look after those people that weren't, you know, Maori. Then Kita Pai, that was a good thing. So our leaders thought one, okay, yes, Queen, come and set up set up an authority structure that can take care of all of those uh, people over there, Kita Pai. Uh, the second reason was from a Maori perspective. Um, the treaty really was a trade agreement um, that, uh, you know, um, these uh, people from overseas were bringing in, you know, iPods and flat screen TVs and, you know, Ford Falcons. <laughs> in other words, all these, all these new technology uh, were, were coming from overseas and our chiefs wanted to secure pathways of trade uh, for their people. So from a Māori perspective, the treaty was also had the hope of securing pathways of trade between overseas and uh, local hapu, uh, local people on the ground uh, who were um, obviously servicing um, through food uh, the, the people who were coming from overseas. And um, another reason that our people were um, keen to enter onto an agreement was because five years before in 1835 our, our chiefs up in the Bay of Islands particularly amongst Napui um, later other tribes participated in it as well uh, signed He Whakaputanga o Te Rangatiratanga o New Tirani or the, the, the Declaration of Independence of the United Tribes of Aotearoa now, in 1830, uh, I think it was 36 or 37, the Declaration of Independence had been uh, received by the House of Commons in England. It had been read out in the House. Uh, the Declaration had also been acknowledged uh, uh, within Congress in the United States of America. So in the late 1830s, powers like United States, but in particular England, had had actually acknowledged the uh, the Declaration of Independence of our chiefs of the Maori tribes of Aotearoa. So when it came to the signing of the treaty, when it came to our chiefs entering into an agreement with Kuwini Wikitoria, it was also it was the it was from a position of uh, a sovereign nation entering into a partnership and an agreement with another an, another sovereign nation. So, um, because the treaty was first presented into the Bay of Islands, uh, 
um, all of this thinking went into the thinking of the Treaty of Waitangi. It all went into part of what was sharing the context. Now, um, if I just back out a minute here from a Māori perspective and return to a Pākehā perspective, um, and particularly the missionary perspective, and the missionary perspective can truly be summed up by this fella, uh, Henry Williams, whom we call Karufa. Karufa means four eyes, hence <laughs> um, uh, Karufa had four eyes. So obviously this is pre Billy T. James. But um, there would be no treaty, uh, or there would be no Tatiriti or Waitangi without Henry Williams, without Karufa. Karufa was the one who um, translated the treaty. Karufa was the one who said to Māori, this was a good idea for our people. Karufa was the one who believed that this thing was a good thing for our people. Now, um, Karufa was the most respected Pākehā in the country uh, in the 1830s. He had, arrived, he had been in the country since 1823. And over, uh, when he first got here, just set his face to learning te reo and learning the ways of te ao Māori. Uh, Henry William, Williams really changed the missionary orientation from being one of civilising Māori, which is what Samuel Marsden had established in 1814. He turned that round to go, hang on, we're living in the land of Māori. It is the best, we need to do our best in engaging in kaupapa Māori, engaging in Māori concepts, and in that way sharing the gospel through, through Māori ways of thinking, as opposed to just bringing in uh, a civilization, civilizing gospel where we want to make Māori British, and in that way then we can share the gospel. So he really changed that way of thinking around. Now, um, in 1839, remember this is the same year that, uh, and the same time, that the New Zealand company set sail for New Zealand. In 1839, uh, Tamihana Te Raupraha, who was the famous chief Te Raupraha's son, he had, became, uh, he had become a Christian. And he heard about these missionaries that were up in the Bay, Bay of Islands. So Tamihana and his cousin, Martin and Te Whifi, they, they, they hiked up or they went up to the Bay of Islands and they met Karufa. And they said to Henry Williams, they said, bro, we want a missionary. Can you send us a missionary down to Ōtaki? And so Henry was like, no, we can't because we don't have any. Now, uh, a 21-year-old called Octavius Hadfield had just arrived in the country. He'd been in the country, I think, about a week. He overheard the conversation and he volunteered himself. And he said, uh, look, Henry, uh, bro, I'm 21. I'm a severe asthmatic. I I'm not expected to live that long. So put me to use. Why don't I go be down? Why don't I go down to Ōtaki and be a missionary to Ngāti Tua, Ngāti Raukawa, and uh, Tatiawa who were living down there at the time? And so Henry, Henry was like, "Sweet ass, bro." And so uh, Henry and Octavius and Tamihana Taropuha and Martin and Tafifi they got on a, a boat and they sailed uh, down the east coast. They come down into Wellington and they arrived down into Whanganui Atara into the, um, the uh, harbour of Pornake, Wellington, and they see a whole bunch of settlers down there. And Henry's like, who are you guys? And they're like, hi, we're the New Zealand company. We've just bought Wellington. And Henry's like, what? Kōrero Māori koutou? Like, do you guys know how to speak the real well? And they're like, no, no. Now check this out. William Wakefield, this is Edward's brother, he had negotiated a deal with Tiatiawa down there at the time. And they had, had negotiated a, a deal of uh, it was a whole bunch of a whole bunch of stuff from a whole bunch of technology. It included, I think, 12 pairs of suits, 12 caskets of gunpowder, like 400 pots and pans or something like this. But the, 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 the amount of uh, the amount of equipment that, that, that Henry that William Williams traded uh, for Wellington what, equaled 400 pounds of stuff. Now, just put this into equivalent uh, uh, let me just compare this. Um, that same summer, uh, a, a whaling captain 
had made 300 pounds personally um, from hunting whales. Um, a year later, when or later on that year, the board, the New Zealand Company board, um, paid William Williams an extra 200 pounds uh, due to the work that he had done uh, as a bonus. Now here was William Wakefield buying all of Wellington um, uh, for 400 pounds of stuff off 600 people, roughly. It's probably more. But is it a fair per purchase in contrast to the amount that was paid to even Wakefield himself and to this other whaling captain? And of course, the answer is 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 no. It's 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 not a fair deal to buy that land with all that stuff for amongst six hundred people. You know, 12, 12 suits. Who who do they go? To? You know. Uh, <laughs> um, now, of course, I'm talking with hindsight here as well. Um, but Henry Williams, he sees this, and he is not a happy camp camper. He then comes out of the harbour. And he's coming around to go up to, to Ōtaki to drop um, the missionary and Tamiana Taropara off. A storm comes up and he's blown over to Golden Bay over Nelson. He gets over to Golden Bay Nelson and he sees all these new settlers over there. And he's like, who are you guys? And they're like, hi, we're the New Zealand company. We've just purchased it. If you can draw in a line from, from basically Collingwood Golden Bay all the way through to Kai Calder, um, the New Zealand company thought that they had purchased that much of land with little negotiation schools, without understanding, you know, tuku whenua, without understanding um, purchasing of land from a Māori context and Māori perspective. Anyway, Henry's fuming. He, he then sails back to Ōtaki, drops them off, and then check this out. Uh, Henry Williams uh, then sails, uh, sorry, not sails, he then walks home. <laughs> He walks home from Ōtaki, goes up to Whanganui, across to Taupo, um, uh, and then eventually through to Matamata and through to Tauranga, gets on a, on, on a boat in, um, in Tauranga and sails home. Takes him two months to, 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 to get home. Everywhere that Henry Williams is going, uh, he's meeting with chiefs, and chiefs are beginning to hear through the grapevine, man, who are these, um, who are these people coming and they want to purchase land? What, what, what's going on here? Um, What's, go what's going to happen? So Henry Williams had just seen the New Zealand company and he was also hearing through the grapevine by meeting with other chiefs throughout the North Island that, hmm, the chiefs are concerned about all these people from overseas that are coming here and want to purchase land. So Henry gets home, uh, I think it was something like uh, January 11th, 1840, uh, which was three weeks before Captain William Hobson shows up uh, with instructions from Sir James Stevens to enter into a treaty agreement with Māori. So Henry knew that something needed to happen to secure the land uh, for, um, uh, for the chiefs. Not for uh, not for the chief's perspective, because the chiefs knew that the land was theirs anyway. But because for all of these people that were beginning to come from overseas, so we all uh, have read the treaty. But let me just read out Article Two: Her Majesty the Queen of England confirms and guarantees uh, to the chiefs and tribes of New Zealand and to the respective families and individual individuals thereof. The full, exclusive, and undisturbed possession of their lands and estates, forests, fisheries, and other properties, which they may collectively or individually possess, so long it is their wish and desire to retain the same in their possession. So this is what uh, uh, this is what um, the treaty um, puts down. Uh, the Māori ver uh, version is an accurate version of this as well, and so chiefs agree to it. Uh, they sign it, uh, and this is what is to follow. So, in the English version, states emphatically that Māori can retain their land. So these documents, uh, these images from the New Zealand Encyclopedia website, show in in the red 
the land that is in Māori holdings and Māori ownership. So from 1860, 20 years after the signing of the treaty, that's what's in Māori ownership. Then we go 50 years to 1890. Then we jump down to 1910 and then to 1939, uh, 100 years after the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi that said that our chiefs can retain our land for as long as we want. That is what is in ownership of the land. If we jump through to the South Island, in 1860, uh, the entire South Island was gone. Uh, the Pākehā understanding and whakaro of the treaty from a Pākehā perspective meant that it was a governmental takeover that we could retain and take land whenever we wanted it for our purposes and for the use of our purposes. Now let me just show you a couple of things as to the legal and governmental gymnastics as to how the Crown eventually did this. In 1852 the British government passes a law that uh, to cre create the New Zealand Parliament. Okay, to be able to vote in the first New Zealand government um, parliament, uh, first you had to be male, so I don't might wahine ma. If you're a woman, you couldn't vote. Uh, hence, kia ora Kate Shepherd for her mahi that she would eventually do. Uh, you had to be 21 years or older, and you had to own indiv you had to own land as an individual from a crown issued title. So if you wanted to vote. Uh, you had to own land, and that land ownership had to be uh, ratified by Crown title issued to you from the government. Now, Māori land was under customary title, so it didn't have uh, Crown, you know, Māori didn't need a paper from the Crown because we signed a treaty that said we could own our land, right? But to, to enter into the government status and to vote, you had to have that crown title paper. So what that meant is that from the outset, uh, Māori weren't allowed to vote in the New Zealand government. Now, uh, come into the 1860s, uh, and particularly around the Waikato region, is that Māori, uh, and in due to some of the other laws that came about, Māori owned land under crown, crown title. And particularly in the Waikato, there were more uh, Māori land owners than there were European, uh, uh, European owners. So in the 1860s, um, the Europeans freaked out and thought, flip, if we allow this to happen, then Māori are going to be able to vote and they'll like vote us and they're going to be able to get into power. What are we going to do? <gasps> I know what we'll do. Let's create the general role and let's create the Māori role. So if you're Māori, you have to sign up to the Māori ro role and we'll dedicate four seats. And so Māori, you can just participate in your own role, in your own electorate. Now that's where the general and the Māori role come from. Again, it was a way of putting Māori outside the decision on where the power seat is held on making decisions for all of the whenua of this country. Now, does that sound fair to you? No, it's not. Um, 1863, the government needs to sell land uh, to settlers. Why do they need to sell land? Because they borrowed money from overseas. Most Māori do not want to sell the land, so the government attacks them. The government then says the Māori cannot fight, so because they're fighting the government, uh, uh, the, gov uh, the government, um, and they punish Māori by taking their land. Now, in the 18th, uh, 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 the 1860s and uh, 1863, this is what George Gray set up. This is what Ehu, the issue of Ehu Matao is. Uh, Three million acres are confiscated later. Um, half a million, uh, half of that is given back. Uh, the following year, 1864, under the Public Work Acts, uh, Māori and European lands could be acquired for roads, railways, and other public works, sometimes without compensation. Some Māori land was targeted for compulsory acquisition in preference to nearby Pākehā land. And roads were sometimes circuitously routed through Māori reserves, right? Actually through, uh, through Māori land. Um, and so a lot of the confiscation of land came under the Public Works Act. 
Um, and um, in 2016, Green MP Catherine Delahunty proposed a law that said, hey, you know what? We now know some of our history. We look back at our history and thought, man, this taking a Māori land, it's not a very good thing. Why don't we write a law that says, you know what? Uh, the Crown can no longer take Māori land under the Public Works Act. So she drew up a bill, now put it in the ballot. So it was drawn out of the ballot. And so it had to go to this, uh, had to go to discuss at its first reading, the government at the time uh, said, you know what, we don't want to deal, we, we, we don't want this uh, coming before the government, so we're just going to take it out. Now, this was, this was in 2016, guys, <laughs> you know, in other words, this is recent history, where the Crown at the time still wanted the right to be able to take Māori land under the Public Works Act. Now, Māori land ownership as of June 2017, we own 4.6, I believe, percent of the land in this country. Now, remember, this comes off the back of an 1840, where our chief signed an agreement said that we can hold on to our land, our treasures, our forests, our fish, for as long as we want, for whenever we want. Right? But unfortunately, the Crown did a whole bunch of rules and a whole bunch of dictating that said that, well, you know what? You can't. We are not going to honour that agreement, that sign. Why? Because we want to create a country. We want to create a way of thinking that comes from, from England and, uh, and overtake this place in a new way. Now, where is the story going? <laughs> why, why am I sharing this? Why do I think it's important for you to know this story? One of the reasons is because I don't think the story has been told very well. Particularly for the last 20, 25 years in education circles, uh, our teachers and our principals and our board of trustees have been told you need to honor the principles of the treaty. Now, I don't know about you, but I think whenever I'm told you must, automatically that puts me internally on the back foot and says, well, I'll stuff you. I don't want to be told to do that. So what is what 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 happens is that you know it's kind of a, a Norman human human, you know, uh, mechanism of pride, really. But what it does is it means whenever, you, whenever you're told you must do something, you approach it from a negative perspective. I think what has happened is that the Treaty of Waitangi has been told from almost in education uh, circles from the perspective of you must. And we've been told the narrative from a narrative of law um, and not from a narrative of really, really, truly understanding the human story of the Treaty of Waitangi. Because the human story of the treaty is amazing. It's positive, it's, it's got some incredible elements to it, um, but it's also got some dark shades as to which I've, I've mentioned to it. But the treaty ultimately is a story of partnership. And to bring this into into our times and to really, really highlight what the story of Māori and what the story of non-Māori Pākehā Tauiwi means in our country, I want to show you a, di a, a little image right now. I'm going to play that game. One of these things is not like the other. So I'm about to show you an image uh, and very quickly just discern, you'll be able to decide this within the first two seconds, which is the odd one out. Okay, so I showed this diagram to a friend of mine many years ago, um, a Māori bro who uh, raised in Tuhua country, spoke, raised speaking Māori, you know, for the first part of his life. And he goes, that's a good one, bro. And straight away, he goes, the person on the right is the odd one out. And I go, oh, why is he the odd one out? And he goes, well, the two on the left, that's mum and that's dad. And then the little one is the child who belongs to mum and dad. So therefore, the one on the right is, is an uncle. And so the uncle was the odd one out. Now, 
Uh, the guy who came up with this diagram, Paul Hebert, passed away in 2008, but he took this diagram around indigenous people all around the world, uh, mainly um, Central Asia and South America. And indigenous peoples all around the world say the same thing. The one on the outside, uh, either one on the outside are the odd ones out because the small one is a child and the child belongs to mum and dad. Making, meaning the uncle uh, is the one slightly on the outside of the family. Now, all of us, including myself, when I first saw this, is like, well, the little one's the old one out because it's the smallest, right? Now, we say that because we've been trained to think that way. We say that because we have been trained to see things not in the context of what they belong to, but we define and we describe things by what they are in and of themselves. Mā tauranga Māori, the Māori perspective, doesn't see things by what it is uh, uh, in and of itself. Uh, you know, I am not Jay, a communicator. I am Jay who whakapapa to, to the mountain of Taranaki. I am connected. Who I am is a connected to the mountain of Taranaki, and I belong to a tribal people group. That's who I am before I'm a communicator or anything like that, before what I do. You see, in, in the West, Western thinking has been trained to, to, to see things by what they are in and of themselves. You define yourself by your own personal preference, by who you are on the inside. A Māori world doesn't define something by what it is in and of itself. Māori define things by the way they relate to the world. I relate to the mountain of Taranaki. I relate to the awa of Waiunganga. I relate to the waka of Tokumaru, right? In, in other words, it is a... It, Māori thinking primarily, indigenous thinking prim, primarily, is a collective way of thinking. It's a, it's a describing by the way things belong not by what they are in and of themselves. So when the reason I'm telling you the story of the treaty is because the treaty in action is the sharing of whakaro. It is the sharing of two ways of thinking about the same thing. Sure, yes, it is the odd one out because it's the smallest, but it's also the odd one out uh, because the uncle doesn't belong to that immediate farmer, right? So um, when we're, this is the treaty of action. Now, how are we going to actually honour the treaty or see the story of the treaty fully, fully outplayed when, um, when people in New Zealand can't think this way? Now, every single Māori person in this country is bicultural. Every single Māori person in this country knows how to speak English, knows how to go to the shop and participate in English and buy their stuff in our Western world. Now, every single Pākehā in this country are not bicultural. New, most New Zealanders don't know how to call it all Māori, therefore are not bicultural. The treaty is a document that says this country, this particular country called Aotearoa New Zealand, is a bicultural country. That we to, that that the government, the crown, and the rangatira tanga of Nga Iwi, uh, Nga Katoa, of all the tribes of New Zealand, come together and create a partnership and create a country that says that we are going to do this through two modus operandi, and together we're going to co con create a new blend of a new country that does things together. This is what the Treaty of Waitangi is all about. And this is what the whakaro of thinking is all about. Now this, embedded within this way of thinking, and the only way that this idea has even come about is because of the men and women who in the 1830s and 1840s carried the hope of the gospel into the story. That this is what the cult, this is what the culture of the gospel brings about. It br begin, it brings about reconciliation. It brings about the quote unquote one new man, right? It br it brings about a fakaro. 
the treaty for non-Māori is an invitation from uh, to non-Māori to engage and to participate in Māori whenua. And then through living and acting on Māori whenua, you live and you act and you begin to understand Māori ways of being. Now, since 1840, people who call themselves New Zealanders haven't done that very well. We had, just haven't. We are now living in the time where every New Zealander is called to, you know, is called to do that well. Now, you and I are hopefully called, our generation is called to be the leaders that begin to teach our young people how to truly, truly be bicultural. And how, the, in, in other words, how to participate in Maori ways of thinking, Maori ways of being, Maori ways of decision making about how this country is supposed to be and how we're going to function in the global world. This is what the treaty is all about. Now, I, I, I share this little image of Rangi and Papa, right? The, the creation narrative of the Maori world that uh, Rangi Nui, Sky Father, and Papa Tuanuku, Sky, uh, 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 sorry, Earth Mother, were dwelling in a, in a, in a, in a bond uh, relationship and their children, particularly Tane Mahu, to separate them and created the world of light for the children to dwell in. Now, um, I think, you know, when you read into um, uh, a Māori lens about the way the universe was created, it has this relationship of oneness between the sky, the heavens, and the earth, that the earth and the heavens are one holistic realm created for the world to partnership in. Now, when I read my Piper Tapu and I, I turn to the first book of the Bible, this is what I read, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If I was to read that in Hebrew, there's a couple of things that point out to me. First thing I want to share is that the word heavens in the male, uh, sorry, in the Hebrew language, uh, they they ascribe uh, masculine and feminine qualities to their to their uh, nouns and to their verbs. The word heaven, uh, they ascribe a male noun to it, and the word for earth, they describe a feminine noun to it. So when I read it, it's like I could be reading, and in the big in uh, in the beginning, God created Ranganui. And Papatuanuku, God created the heavens and the earth. So the way of thinking of a Māori perspective is very similar to the way of thinking for an ancient Hebrew world. Now, here's an un other interesting thing from a Hebrew perspective. If I read it in originally in the Hebrew word, then the first word in the Hebrew Bible is called beginning, is, is the word uh, beginning. When they they have a way of interpreting the Bible called uh, gem, Gematria, I think it's called, or Gematria, uh, and so they ascribe to 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 letters they ascribe a numeric value. So the very first letter in the Bible is B for the word beginning or or, or, or Beth. Now that means that the number two. So when a Hebrew thinks it, they are thinking, hmm, two. They thinking of peers, they think of duality, they think of plural plurality. So they, so when they begin to read the Genesis account, a Hebrew mind is looking for a duality of things. So they read that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. They read that God created light and darkness that God created day and night, that God created morning and evening, that he separated the water from above and the water below, that he created the land and the sea, that he created sun and moon, that he created male and female, and then there was work and there was rest. In other words, God is looking, when God creates things, he creates things whole as one, but then he separates. There's a separating of things for the purpose of fellowship, for the purpose of, of um, creating a wholeness. So there's never, what we do in the West is we think male and female. No, God thinks wholeness 
he created them male and female. He thinks oneness, he thinks wholeness. It's the same as Rangi and Papa, is that there's a creation of a whole, but there's two separate entities. So God creates individuality, not for the sake of just the individual, but for the sake of partnership. What the treaty does to us is that tre the, tre the treaty calls us into a partnership of two ways of thinking. What God has created in an Aotearoa is not Pākehā and Māori, but God is creating Māori and Pākehā for the sake of creating what the Bible might say, one new man, one new creation. Now, this is what you're called to do. You are called to, to, to exhort young people to participate in a Māori world, to begin to learn to enter into Māori ways of thinking and Māori ways of being. Now, the only way you can do that is by entering into Māori spaces, which means you have to get up of your very, very centralised Māori way of thinking, Māori way of being, and actually enter into a Māori space. Now, let me just um, close with some questions that teachers put to me. Uh, now, um, um, when um, they, 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 they hear me talk, here's some questions. As an educationalist from a migrant background, how do I stay authentic to my own culture while embracing and honouring Māori culture? What is the unifying space of the gospel? How does the gospel shape identity? What is an honest assessment of the role of missionaries, government, Māori, Pākehā migrants? If we are predominantly Pākehā school, what do we want those children to learn to bless all of New Zealand? Now, what I've tried to do in my talk today is to address all these things, but a couple of things I want to say is that a lot of the times we say, well, hang on, aren't we a multicultural country and a multicultural uh, nation? Yes, we are, but our places of power that make all the decisions for our multicultural country is only monocultural. In other words, our country in, in the place of power is monocultural only. We're not even, we're not bicultural yet. The story of the treaty is about us entering into, into a truly bicultural way. When you and I can kōrero Māori and kōrero Pākehā, when you and I can be comfortable at going to the movie theatres uh, and then also be comfortable in going to the marae, going to Tangihana, going to Māori Hui, when we can be comfortable in those places, then we're practising being bicultural. So at the moment, we're not a multicultural nation. We're a monocultural-led country that provides multicultural spaces. Big difference. Um, secondly, uh, um, the f um, in answering an honest assessment, what I've attempted to do today is, is to restore you around the treaty and provide some narrative points of, of the context of the treaty, mainly Kororareka, um, the New Zealand company, uh, and the humanitarians working in the British office. Big reasons are uh, that the gospel spoke into all of these things. Uh, but the big reason why I, I believe that places of schools need to participate in the treaty is because of this. Uh, we have 20, 20 years until we commemorate the bicentenary of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And then let me just stop sharing my screen here. We have 20 years uh, before our country commemorates the story of the treaty? Is it just going to be commemoration or will it be celebration? You know, our, you know, three years ago, the prime minister that was voted in was only 37. You know, the, the kids in our schools in 2040, our kids in our schools right now, some of them in 2040 will be 37. Can be the same age as our, what our prime minister was when she became prime minister. What we have to do is that we have to create leaders. And if we're going to create leaders, you and I have to be the ones that do the hard work and put ourselves in Māori spaces where we begin to learn from uh, Māori ways of thinking about the world. 
This is why the Treaty of Waitangi is very, very important. It is an invitation and it is a call for you to say no. If you want to be a real, if you actually want to be the New Zealand that I think God is calling New Zealand to be, then you have to be the leaders. You have to lead yourself by participating in a Māori world. And in you participating in a Māori world, you are going to be helped able to help assist our young people in entering into Māori spaces and, and being able to enter into a way of a holistic thinking about the world. Because the way of the West has broken the world up into individual chunks and are not very good at putting the world back together again, right? Humpty Dumpty effect. Te ao Māori are great at seeing from a holistic relational perspective. And that's why the treaty is important. So, Ehua Ma, Anei Taku Kōrero, Kua Mutu Taku Kōrero Mo Tenei Rā. That is the end of my kōrero for the day. Um, I, I hope this kōrero helps. Um, likewise, I'm going to hang around and be on Zoom for questions and answers. So, what I'd love you to do is to think about some of your questions that this kōrero might raise for you. And uh, I'm going to be available to um, have a discussion and answer some questions that you might have later on that this presentation may have brought up for you. So, iho mā a tēnā rā koutou, tēnā rā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora.